Hi, once again, everybody. Welcome to the Health Channel. All health, all the time. I'm Ed Berliner. These are the Baptist Health South Florida studios in Coral Gables. Thank you so much for joining us. A healthy brain is something we all strive for, especially as we get older. When your brain is healthy, you're better able to pay attention, solve problems, communicate, and a whole lot more. So what are the ways we can keep our brain healthy? Well, today on the Health Channel, we'll answer that and a whole lot more. Joining me here is Dr. Paul Damsky, a neurologist at the Baptist Health Neuroscience Center. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ed, for having me. Let's talk about the brain. Please. Start things off. The American Heart Association talks about poor brain health. I want to show everybody a graphic here and talk about some of the things here. This is what they put down here as the poor brain health. But right up here, I, I think what people don't realize is it is a public health epidemic. Why is that? What, what, what's behind that? Well, many of the problems that we find with brain health get worse typically as people get older. And this population is getting older. And as it happens, we just have more people with the problem. So we're talking about predominantly Alzheimer's disease here today. It's estimated that somewhere about one out of three people who are in their 80s will actually have Alzheimer's disease. As that population grows into the 80s, we're just going to see more and more of it. I was fascinated by the numbers that I, I saw from this, that you show a cognitive decline as you enter your 20s. I never would have thought that. Has, has it been decreasing, increasing? Has that just been the standard norm for a long period of time? I, I think that's fairly typical, fairly accurate. You know, we have many more demands, I think, on our intellect these days with so many competing products, computers and such, that we may notice it a little bit more. Um, the problem that we find typically with a problem such as Alzheimer's disease or dementia, and we'll describe that in a bit, is a lot of these problems really start probably decades before the actual problem is noted by the family. So you're losing brain cells constantly. It starts in the 20s and the 30s. And as you get older and older, you finally get to a point where you have had enough loss of brain cells that is really clinically notable. Three out of five Americans will develop a brain disease in their lifetime. Again, I, I'm shocked by that. I would have thought that it would have been less. Has that been rather standard as well? Occasionally, I wonder if three out of five Americans have brains, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you said that because now we can open up the conversation into an entirely different area. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think we'll stay to, st stick with health today. Um, but seriously, however, and I'm not uh, alleging any political allegiance here. The... Um, uh, you know, the brain has obviously so many things that it does, and I think when they're talking about brain health problems, they're talking about mental health issues, um, they're talking about dementias, they're talking about things like seizure disorder or epilepsy, they're talking about Parkinson's disease. So uh, we're actually, neurologists tend to be only 2 to 4% of the doctors, but in fact we're dealing with a huge variety of problems that affect so many of us. And by 2030, the total cost of Alzheimer's, dementia, and stroke expected to exceed $1 trillion dollars. Again, a shocking note here. Is that simply, is that part of early treatment, in treatment? Brain, where is that, why is that number rising so ex exponentially? I don't know the economics terribly well, but I'll tell you from my own experience, Please. which is that we have a variety of costs which come. You know, people, for instance, I treat a lot of people who have strokes, and uh, stroke hits you one time and then the rest of your life can be as, uh, affected by the stroke. So someone may have trouble talking, someone may have trouble moving an arm or a leg, they can't walk, and all of a sudden someone who had been productive in his 50s or 60s no longer can work. It affects the family. You then have people who also had other jobs or were taking care of the house or doing other things like that, and suddenly they need to come to bat to help out with that person who no longer can take care of him or herself. So we lose one on productivity, which is a big portion of the cost, and it tends to be a productivity issue which lasts the rest of the life, as opposed to, let's mm. say, sometimes people will get a heart attack, they're out of it for maybe a few months, they have to go to cardiac rehab. In some cases, certainly people can't produce like they would have otherwise because they just don't have the energy to do it, but generally they can get by a little bit more easily. Someone who has a neurologic problem, such as a stroke or a degenerative problem, something which gets worse over time, something like Parkinson's disease, for instance, they get worse and worse or they stay bad for quite a long time. I think that's one of the issues. Another issue is that the brain has been notorious. A lot of the 
chemicals that go into us, the pharmaceuticals, the research, spend a lot of money in development. They go through many failures because we do a lot of uh, research on rats, on pigs, on other animals. It seems to work fairly well. And then we do it on humans and then it fails miserably. So we go through many of these cycles of treatments uh, and it, it just often doesn't work. And when you start looking at some of the treatments that are available, someone with multiple sclerosis, for instance, where there's a problem where the outside of the nerve, the myelin, the insulation doesn't work, and people end up having trouble in their 30s or 40s with trouble walking, dizziness, they lose vision in an eye. Those treatments will cost $60,000 just for the medication and for a year. Uh, and the estimate is that compared to most people, MS patients, for instance, will cost about $24,000 more per year to treat. And that's not including people who are actually treated fairly aggressively where the treatments can be astronomically expensive. Let's get into the brain and dig in a little bit. We have a 3D model here that I would like you to reference here. And let's talk a little bit about some of the parts of the brain most associated with memory or memory loss. As you look at this then, tell us first about where most of the, uh, the studies show us most of the memory okay. comes from. Yeah, sure. The, um, this is a cross cut of the brain. I'm just going to, it basically it's as if someone is slicing the brain this way. Uh, and what we're seeing here is this is, uh, I'm going to use a neurologist or a radiologist uh, view of the world, which is looking at one of these types of pictures. Over here is the right side, here is the left side. This is the top of the brain. Down here is what we call the brain stem, which is the lower portion of the brain. That takes care of a lot of things like eye movements, hearing, uh, movement of the mouth, movement of the face. So uh, it's not exactly the most precise cut through here, but, but this is a temporal lobe out to the side. So basically just behind the ear is what we call the temporal lobe. The inner portion of the temporal lobe, the medial portion as we call it, has a part called the hippocampus. And that's really the main focus initially for memories coming into the brain. So somebody tells you something, eventually you, know, you hear it, it gets routed into that hippocampus that memory starts to get placed down at that particular point. Or you see something and then there are fibers coming from the back of the head all the way to the front uh, towards that, the, the middle portion. And that's where the memory tends to come about. Do we find any one specific part of the brain where more of the memory loss seems to come from, where it seems to degenerate faster? Those portions that I mentioned, that hippocampus, uh, we'll see the most sort of drastic, and this is not an Alzheimer's, but a, a fairly similar process. If someone, let's say, has a heart arrest, a cardiac arrest, their heart stops, and they then don't have enough blood to the brain. The brain is exquisitely sensitive to lack of sugar or glucose, lack of oxygen. The blood is bringing that up there. When the heart stops, all of a sudden the brain for just a few minutes doesn't get enough of what it needs and it can't get rid of waste products. It's so metabolically active. It's so active in trying to get the nerves doing what it has to do that the brain just fails in that very particular area. That hippocampus is so sensitive to lack of oxygen. So we will find people who are down without a, a heart rate for two or three minutes they come back pretty well, they're awake, they're able to talk, they can see, and then they just can't remember things. And it's this phenomenal uh, injury to their brain where you say something and two minutes later they're asking the same exact question of uh, what, are we, what are we talking, what did you just tell me? Um, with something like Alzheimer's, it's a much more gradually progressive course. And what will happen is there are these proteins that seem to get put down. We're still trying to figure out what is it that truly brings about Alzheimer's disease. But we find some associative proteins. So there's what we call a beta amyloid. It's just kind of this sheath of, of different types of proteins that get stuck in cells that it shouldn't be. And the place where it tends to get stuck most is in that hippocampus. You've mentioned dementia and Alzheimer's here, and you've, you've done some of the biologics here. But we hear people almost seem to interchange those words. I have a relative who suffers from dementia. I have one who suffers from Alzheimer's. What do they get wrong when, when they're using these two words and, and trying to make them sound like they're the same thing? Uh, I don't think they get anything wrong, actually. Uh, if you think of your Venn diagrams from high school, we have big circles and how they intersect. 
basically the big circle is dementia. Um, very basically, dementia is a category of medical problems where people have loss of different types of thinking. It almost always starts with memory loss, what we call amnesia or an amnestic problem. But with things like Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, they will also lose problem, uh, the ability to orientate themselves. They can't find themselves around a Costco. They can't find themselves in the refrigerator. They don't know where they put things. Uh, they have language trouble in some cases. These types of diseases are called dementias. Now within dementias, there are different subcategories. So different types of actual diseases which produce a dementia-like picture. And they may work by different mechanisms. With Alzheimer's, as I mentioned, you get a, an excess of some kind of protein. We don't know if it's somehow an immune response, if there may have been a virus that got into the brain. It's not really clear exactly what happens. There are some, clearly some genetic components to it as well. But these proteins get put down in that hippocampus and a few other places. People tend to have memory problems first, but then over time they can't take care of themselves they have trouble talking, they get disoriented in space, they can't figure out what time of the year it is, things of that nature. Another big category of dementia is what we call a vascular dementia. So a very different start for the dementia, it tends to start with a stroke or multiple strokes. And what happens is that the brain gets hit in certain places um, and you get hit in enough places and the circuits connecting parts of the brain because it's not always just the focus of where it happens, but sometimes there are connections going to different places. Those don't work anymore, and if you get enough of them, you will actually then get a similar presentation of a dementia. And we as clinicians have difficulty often telling one apart from the other, so I don't expect that someone who is not a doctor to be able to figure that out terribly easily either. Um, the standard you know, medical school textbook definition of a vascular dementia would be someone who has a stepwise problem. So they're doing okay, suddenly they drop down and they can't think for a while in a certain way, they go for a few months, go for a few years, boom, they get another stroke, whether it's obvious or not obvious, they decline as well and it goes in that sort of fashion. Let me bring in the list here because according to the Alzheimer's Association, two of the following core mental functions must be significantly impaired to consider dementia, would you would you agree with this? Now, out of these uh, out of these two, but, but let's let's even take it a step further. Out of these five that you see here, the mental functions impact of a dementia, which ones do you see more common, more usually? Yeah, I mean, the uh, most frequent certainly is memory, uh, and in fact, there are just to distinguish it from other types of dementias, there are very specific types of dementias where you instead will have problems with language. For instance, I've got a guy who came in the office last week. In his 50s, for the past year or so, he can't really say things. He talks this gibberish that is really difficult to understand. You ask him a question, and he starts answering in these nonspecific terms which don't quite relate to it. That is a type of dementia called a primary progressive aphasia. So it ends up aphasia is lack of talking, lack of language. That's a very specific type of dementia that's not the usual. The usual is Alzheimer's where you really have memory problems. Um, and that's first and foremost what you'll see. Those other types of memory problems or cognitive problems that we see on the screen here, these are a sampling of a large variety of cognitive problems that you have to have an association. When we make the diagnosis of a dementia, and I have people coming in to me, the so-called worried well, but understandably worried because as we said, many of these problems begin in people's 20s or 30s or 40s, and that's when they start to notice the problems. Um, but they come to me with memory difficulty. I would not make a diagnosis of a dementia until someone actually has a loss of function. So there are pathologic definitions where we cut up someone's brain. I don't like to do that to most of my patients. Uh, I think most of your patients are very happy it. at this moment. They, they, they're feeling much better uh, about themselves. I, I think so. <laughs> um, I'm not much of a good cutter either, so I think they would be uh, happy with bad, my, my bad lack of... cutter bad, will not cut patients. Okay, we'll lack of dull knife. Okay, please go ahead. Um, so <laughs> we pathologically have diagnoses, but in fact, on my day-to-day -day practice, people come to me, they have a complaint, I examine them, and that's how we make a diagnosis. 
So what I need to hear from the patient or more often the family because frequently because of the thinking problems the patient can't really come up with a good explanation for how they're feeling. Yeah, my memory is not good but they can't explain it terribly well. Mm. Some are pretty astute but often that insight the knowledge of the what's family really sees going it more than they do many times, and the family is typically the one to notice. I mean, it's usually the daughter who knows the patient pretty well and has seen the patient get worse, or the kid who comes in from out of town, sees the patient every three months, and each time the patient seems to look worse. What I really need to hear is though, that there's a loss of function. So they used to be able to manage their finances. Now they're starting to make errors in their checkbook. Um, people are calling them up and getting money out of them when they shouldn't be. Um, they forget how to get things at the grocery store. They leave the stove on much more often than I tend to do, I hope. I'm going to stop you there because you're talking about a decline, which we are going to talk about as, as well. Right, but the, that, just that to understand the definition of a dementia, it's not just the memory loss, but it's sufficient memory loss that you actually lose function because it's a very important distinction clinically. And if you look at all of the definitions out there, from a clinical standpoint, when I say clinical, I mean what is it that I see in my clinic? So what is it I see from what they're telling me and what I'm examining? It's when you have that loss of function that really we then get into the definition of dementia. People who have some memory loss but don't yet have that significant loss of function have what we call a mild cognitive impairment or MCI. Mm -hmm. So those are people who uh, as we've mentioned a few times, people will start to have some decline in their memory, even in their 20s, I would say more noticeable in their 30s and particularly 40s. That goes with the vision I, I mm -hmm. hear. Um, but they will have more memory loss than an age-related person. So we have very specific neuropsychology testing. That's where we have a psychologist who goes through hours of little mind games to see how does someone do on language, how does someone do with calculations of math. Okay, and I'm going to stop you there because we have to take a break, but exactly where you're at is okay. where we're going to go, which is a lot of these, these games and these things that need to be done for brain health. Uh, we will be talking about that. When it comes to your brain, there's a lot we can do to keep it healthy and prevent that cognitive decline, which is very important. Coming up next, we'll be talking all about that, including different lifestyle improvements that you can make. We'll get to all that. You're watching the Health Channel, All Health, All the Time. Be sure to visit our website, allhealthallthetime.com. Submit questions for the experts or to find out more about the Health Channel on South Florida PBS. Uh, we have some testing to do. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Joan London. 84 million Americans are facing a serious health risk and don't even know because they have no symptoms. Are you one of them? We're talking about prediabetes, a condition where your blood sugar level is higher than normal and without intervention will likely become full-on type 2 diabetes within five years. But the good news is you can keep that from happening. By eating healthy and being more active, you can greatly reduce your risk. And there is help for you at the National Diabetes Prevention Program. I became a diabetes educator because it's a disease that is spreading all over our country, and it's something that could affect anybody. We focus on people who have diabetes um, or prediabetes, and it's really important to have people prevent this chronic disease. I teach them a lot about movement. I teach them about their heart rate and how to keep it safe. And we don't ever use that word diet. I hate that word, actually. <laughs> It really is just them learning basic, fundamental nutrition. Georgina's gotten us to really look at food differently. Uh, I, I find myself going to supermarkets and spending much more time reading uh, food labels. The members thank me every week by reaching their goals and making themselves proud. My lifestyle has changed. I'm, I'm drinking more water. When I got um, with my doctor this past year, I think at that point I was like probably 190, going to 200 pounds. I'm 170 something now. I started learning a lot of stuff that I don't know. I'm still learning. That's what I keep coming because she's a very nice teacher. And I improve a lot. When a member makes huge changes, it's like winning the lottery. It's like saving someone's life.
Dementia is not a specific disease. It's an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms associated with a declining memory or other thinking skills, severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. While symptoms of dementia can vary greatly, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired to be considered dementia. Memory, communication and anguish, ability to pay attention, reasoning and judgment, visual perception. If you feel like you or someone in your family might be experiencing these symptoms, contact your primary care physician so that an evaluation can be performed. Welcome back to the Health Channel, All Health All the Time. I'm Ed Berliner. Thanks again for joining us. With us today, Dr. Paul Damsky, a neurologist at the Baptist Health Neuroscience Center. We're talking all about brain health this hour, including how to improve your memory and have optimal brain function. So, Doctor, when we talk about the brain, we can do a lot to keep it healthy. It, it just seems to be simple in everything we do in our lives. Have a healthy lifestyle and it will help all parts of your body. I don't think people think that it will also help the brain as well. It's part of the whole body, the whole uh, package. Uh, Ed, I would agree. And in fact, you know, I was asked to prepare for the show about really what can we supplement in our lives to make our lives healthy for the brain standpoint. It's difficult as a physician because I really need to depend on studies out there saying that X has been studied in multiple patients and it really is shown to really make a difference when it comes to Alzheimer's or why it was studied but it didn't really seem to do that. A lot of the things we take for granted as so-called healthy living have not been studied adequately so it's really there's a lack of information that I can give to people. I think in general my philosophy towards life is do things that seem to be healthy based on the latest recommendations by different groups that have been looking into it try to do it in some moderation as well. So the usual things that we would be thinking about, exercise, exercise, exercise. I think that is optimal to really keeping you healthy. From a brain standpoint, we see that probably it's the most effective thing, better than almost any drug essentially, in trying to maintain your memory, keep you healthy, and also for people who even have developed some Alzheimer's disease, we notice that exercise will help. Now, unfortunately, I can't give recommendations that are unabashed. You exercise and things are going to get well because clearly we see people who exercise and they get ill. If you look at studies, they look at different parameters. Part of the trouble when you're looking at these studies and how that translates then into what a doctor reads and then can recommend to patients is that we have very specific things we have to look at. So when someone designs a study, they have to say ahead of time, okay, I'm looking at people who are doing three days of 20 minutes of exercise a week compared to couch potatoes. We study them for, typically you only have about three months to do it because people get tired of doing the study and they either want to get more exercise or they want to get less exercise and it's hard to control for all that. How do they do on tests at the beginning? How do they do on tests at the end? And they're really artificial parameters because you can't say to a couch potato, generally, don't get up and ever go to do anything but go to the bathroom. They're obviously getting some exercise. Likewise, you can get people into this group of doing exercise for 20 minutes three times a week and yeah, I made twice this week, I made once this week. It's not always 
quite as consistent as you'd like them to be. So it's really hard to design these trials. And then you're looking for very specific things. You're looking for those neuropsychology tests that I had referred to before. Can somebody come up with a certain number of words that begin with the letter F, for instance, within a minute? And you're trying to see the people who exercise versus the people who didn't exercise, who's more likely to come up with that? When you put all this together, there is that exercise factor that has to come in there, but there's also the healthy diet. I'm fascinated by the Mediterranean diet, which continues to talk about the, the good fortune it brings, the, the health benefits that it brings, and, and talks about all this. Can we, have we been able to, again, study-wise, take things like the Mediterranean diet and focus in on exactly what it does or, or some specific areas that it does to help the brain and, and, and help you with better brain health? It's hard to pick apart some of those pieces. We do see, I was just focusing on exercise, but clearly diet seems to have some relationship. Uh, the dietary recommendations tend to come from these very long studies. They look at a big population of people. They try to get a sampling by phone calling, by you know, entering things on a computer. What am I eating today? What's a typical diet? And try to get a pattern for people who eat things like the Mediterranean diet, so relatively little meat, high oils like olive oil, a lot of vegetables, things of that nature. Uh, and how do they do compared to the standard American diet of French fries and burgers? Um, Not well. <laughs> <laughs> and just really try to get an idea on how many people have different kind of problems. And, and we're often not looking just at brain health, but in those studies, frequently heart health is the, the main focus. Um, often that which helps the heart also helps the brain, and it makes a whole lot of sense. So those people tend to have a little bit less salt in their diets, their blood pressure tends to be better controlled, uh, and we find that, particularly for that vascular dementia that we were talking about before, blood pressure management is really super important in trying to help reduce damage to the brain. You know, what happens with the blood pressure is there's a big bunch of pressure going up to your head because your heart's pumping real hard, your blood vessels are getting really tight, and you'll find on different pictures that you've got a whole bunch of little white spots all over the brain if someone's blood pressure has been poorly controlled for quite a while. As opposed to someone generally who has good blood pressure control, their brain looks a whole lot cleaner. If you do some microscopic slides of the brain, you don't find as much damage either. So keeping blood pressure under control is real important there too. What about supplements? Supplements is tough, and I'll tell you, I have trouble figuring out what to make of things, and I can only imagine what it might mean to someone who is not a physician, who hasn't had, uh, not that I am smarter necessarily, but I've been through the training to have, you know, understand to some extent what's necessary for studies, what kind of literature is out there, how do I even access the literature. What you find, in many cases, you do a search for supplements and dementia, and you get about three pages on Google or whatever search engine you're looking for, which are basically advertisements for one thing or another. And it's really difficult to figure out which, what to make of it. Well, do we have any proof anywhere or substantive idea when you take things like fish oil, B vitamins, vitamin E, that there is any proven value whatsoever yeah. in brain health? At this point, very little, unfortunately. Um, we have a variety of supplements, uh, some of the ones that you mentioned. Ginkgo biloba was sort of one of the big things when I was first in medical school, and even then it was started, starting to come a little bit out of favor. Things which seem to be associated with better function on dementia. Um, when and you'll find lots of little studies, and part of the problem is the company that's selling the product is naturally going to want to sell you on studies that seem to show that they're... They are, at the yeah. end of the day, salespeople. Absolutely, and that's a problem. And it, you get less of it for things like vitamin E because people are not making too many dollars on vitamin E, typically. But you get another supplement. Uh, I'm not sure if I should be mentioning names here, but for instance, I go on a particular site, and I look for their evidence, and they have one trial, which is based out of Madison, where it doesn't even look like it was published. And it does seem to show some trend, and if you're looking at it in a fairly relaxed style, oh, they did much better, but you know, when you have someone who actually understands the statistics of this and how these trials are designed, you start seeing that, yes, there was some improvement here, but there was not improvement here. They don't go into that type of discussion. Um, and in science, what we really need to do is reproduce 
data. So we need to have a study which shows that there is an effect. Somebody else, somewhere else, will do the same study or pretty similar to it and get a similar effect. And when you have enough of these together, you get some ideas that that really is the proof. So a lot of these supplements have one or two things that seem to show help, but other studies that don't. And if you put it all together, it, there's not a very convincing argument that supplements work. What does the data tell us about something as simple as sleep? Uh, sleep's important. Uh, it, it doesn't, from what I know, have a huge association in terms of pre prevention of dementia. I think everybody on a daily basis can really get an idea that if they're not sleeping well, they're not generally thinking well. Um, I'll give you one example, which I think is was still remains striking. It's a couple of years ago already. I had a very sharp lady. She was probably in her late 70s, and I had been seeing her for a few years for a few other issues, different pains here and there. And she came to me, and she couldn't think. She couldn't get a sentence out. She forgot things. She was forgetting her words, and clearly looked like she had Alzheimer's. I mean, it was a very, a little bit quick for that, but a pretty typical presentation for the Alzheimer's disease with memory loss, disorientation, things of that nature, gradually progressive. And just in interviewing her, it seems that she really was not sleeping very well. And I then did some studies to look at, did she have a sleeping disorder? She went in for a sleep study overnight. They did a study to see how well she was breathing at nighttime, and she was found to have obstructive sleep apnea. So that's a problem where the, let's say the tongue is in the mouth and it's the back of the throat. The tongue kind of backs onto the back of it. Mm -hmm. You get snoring as that uh, starts to rattle and shake. But over the nighttime, the air is not passing through the mouth terribly well. The brain goes from a very deep sleep to a much lighter level of sleep. So every night she's in bed. What she we call almost she's a REM sleep, if you will, or a deeper sleep. You'll often actually miss the REM sleep or have a much reduced REM sleep because you don't get deep enough to get that REM sleep, exactly. Um, so that happens night after night. People think they're sleeping. They wake up, they're not terribly alert. By the late, af late morning, early afternoon, they have to fall asleep. They've got to fall asleep again. They're watching television, they fall asleep. They're in a car, they fall asleep. So she had sleep apnea. I had her go back in to get a CPAP machine, which is basically mm -hmm. pressure to pull that tongue off of the back of the throat. And the next time I saw her, she was back to her sharp, normal self. And that was kind of an extreme example of it, but that shows you how important sleep is. But it Absolutely. shows us that we have to have a good night's sleep. Absolutely. No matter how we think about it, you've sure. still got to get it in six hours, seven hours, whatever it is, get a good night's sleep. Okay, so far we have covered diet, supplements, sleep, how they all relate to the brain. Coming up next, we'll be talking about some more ways you can improve brain function in your everyday life. How about, well, we talked about exercise, that's one thing. Keep busy at exercise, but stay intellectually busy is a huge part of it as well. You're watching the Health Channel, All Health, All the Time. Visit our website, allhealthallthetime.com. Your questions there for the experts. Find out more about the Health Channel right here on South Florida PBS. Stay healthy. Get ready. We'll be right back. A concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury, or TBI, caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head, or by a hit to the body that causes your head and brain to move rapidly back and forth. This sudden movement can literally cause the brain to bounce around or twist in the skull, stretching and damaging the brain cells and creating chemical changes in the brain. What you might not know is that these chemical changes make the brain more sensitive to any increased stress or injury until it fully recovers. Worried about keeping your brain sharp as you age? Studies show that these four steps may help. Stay physically active. Strive for two and a half hours of moderate exercise weekly. Reduce vascular risk factors like high blood pressure and cholesterol with good diet, adequate sleep, and medication when necessary. Talk to your doctor about diseases and drugs that may impair brain function, and keep your brain lively with social and intellectual pursuits. For more information, visit Dana.org. past 50 years, we've made a lot of progress in smoking prevention. But if we don't do more, one out of every 13 children alive today will die early from smoking. That's 5.6 million precious lives 
we can save. Together, we can make the next generation tobacco free. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Ed Berliner, thanks again for joining us. With us today, Dr. Paul Damsky, a neurologist at the Baptist Health Neuroscience Center. Now, before the break, we discussed many different lifestyle factors that can impact brain function. We talked a little bit about exercise. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Doctor, is it not fair to say that the steps we take for a healthy heart, that's really the first thing people say. Get your heart healthy, your cardiovascular system healthy, but it, it's going to have an immediate impact on the brain, and people just don't think about that. Yeah, absolutely, Ed. The um, brain benefits from exercise probably as much as the heart does, and a lot of the reason, even Alzheimer's disease, which is this problem where you get these proteins put down in different parts of the brain, there's clearly a vascular component to it. So we'll find that people who don't have well-controlled blood pressure, people who don't get exercise, they get more of those proteins put down. Is it chemistry then? I mean, are we talking about brain chemistry uh, that changes? Ultimately, it ends up being, I think probably what happens to some extent is that there's a lack of a sufficient oxygen going up there, and there's then damage, and probably one of the responses that the brain has is by putting down those proteins, and it's probably likely part of some kind of immune response producing that problem. Does it reduce inflammation in the brain? Does exercise reduce yes. inflammation? It, it probably does help. You know, when we talk about some of the supplements, some of them are geared towards antioxidants and other things which seem to help with inflammation. I don't think they're well enough proven yet, but I think ultimately when we get to a proper treatment for Alzheimer's disease, it's probably going to include some anti-inflammatory component. Are we looking at any specific type of exercise weightlifting, running, walking, swimming, anything, or is it simply just getting the heart beating, getting things moving that helps the brain move along? Uh, it's a little difficult to define exactly. Clearly, the cardiovascular exercises seem to be the most help. Um, we, you know, I'm a neurologist, so from my view of the world, it's everything here and everything below the neck. So everything below the neck is kind of important to get blood to the brain. But in fact, we are whole human beings and we need bone health and we need heart health and things like that. So doing weight exercises, for instance, helps to maintain your muscle, helps to keep your bones healthy by putting stress on them. And it helps you to be able to do exercise and to be able to live a good life because you're actually able to ambulate, you're able to walk, you're able to get out there and do the things that you'd like to be able to do. You just use the word stress. We all have stress. You talked about it was a different kind of stress different you stress talked about. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but let's now go to that other kind sure. of stress that we have in our day every single moment of the day. I, I've got to believe that stress of any kind has a negative effect on the brain. I think from a functional standpoint, absolutely. And I will see two or three people in their 40s, young 40s, late 30s per week who say, Doc, I'm just not able to think very well. And if you probe into it, Many of the times it's because they have stress. They've got a young family, they've got a job that's difficult, their boss is on their case. I mean, a whole variety of things which on a daily basis makes them feel somewhat stressed, somewhat constricted. They can't then be as open in their thinking as they'd like to do. Now, I talked before about some of the problems that we have with research, but you know, in reality, when we're talking about giving recommendations to people, you have to take a holistic approach to things. And People are not just studies and what we find on studies. I love meditation myself. I've been doing it for a while now, and I had done Tai Chi when I was younger. I find for me personally that when I'm able to relax myself, let go of some of that stress, not let things bother me quite as much, I'm able to think much more clearly. And I recommend that often to my patients, even though I don't have data saying specifically that meditation helps prevent dementia or things like that. So I think that for people who are having trouble with thinking, with their memory, they need to learn how to deal with some of the stressors and not to let it bother them quite as much. The stress comes at you, but it's how you respond to it that matters. What about intellectual stimulation? Puzzles, crosswords, uh, Sudoku, anything that, that you do? I, I have to believe that, and again, not the doctor, just play one on TV, that as long as your mind is working, that's always been what, what I was taught as a kid, keep your mind moving and functioning, and this is a great way to give yourself a better, a, a better brain health. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Um, my impression, my it has to be that way, and I feel the same way that you do in a lot of respects, is that yes, 
keep active, keep mentally involved, and you're going to do well. The data is a little difficult to parse because you find that when people do these games, let's say they get online and they do one of these thinking games to try to prevent dementia, they do really well at that game. They practice it and they can do that Sudoku very well or they can do the crossword puzzle very well, but it doesn't necessarily translate into the rest of what they do. I think from my perspective, what's more important is to generally keep active. And it's not just intellectually active, so somebody should be reading, picking up a hobby, playing a musical instrument, something like that, but it's also social. So they really need to keep some social inter involvement with people. I think part of the social involvement is that when you're together with people, you're talking, you're challenged to really come up with answers and have something to say and thinking about mm -hmm. things. So that's a mental exercise in You're itself. interacting. You're interacting and you get some stress reduction depending on the family um, because you you know, are able to vent your problems, you're able to talk about things, you're able to joke and laugh. Um, and we find actually if you look at these big population studies, the people who are socially isolated tend to do worse. So even if you're very well educated, you've been keeping up with things, if you're alone all the time, you're not going to do as well as if you've got some social network. Well, l let me then turn, it's funny you mentioned social isolation because video games now come up as well. Mm -hmm. And in many instances, people do complain that it is just that. It is an isolating thing. You're doing it by yourself and there really isn't anybody else involved. However, I've got to believe again that there's must be some sort of brain interaction here. You're, you're you're dealing, you're looking, you're working, your, your mind is working, your eyes working. Some say video games turn your brain to mush. What's the reality here? Is it good? Well, I've got a 14-year-old son who seems to uh, find my iPad every time he walks in the house. <laughs> and I will tell you, my gut feeling is just as you say, it's probably not that great. One of the studies which bothered me <laughs> deeply and internally was a population study looking at older men who had not yet developed dementia. What kind of activities do they do? And unfortunately, from my perspective, but this is what they find, the readers, the musical instrument players, they did okay. It was actually the guys on the computers who did better than almost anybody else in terms of activities. And I, I, I'm not sure the reason for it, and it wasn't a reproduced study, but I think what you're referring to is that they're probably at least getting on there, looking up new things, and I suspect with any technology, it's how you use it. And I'm not sure that my 14-year-old on whatever game he's playing this week is necessarily getting as much out of it as someone who's using the computer to, let's say, look up things that they're interested in and develop a new hobby of sorts. So it, again, comes back to that word moderation. I, that I think so. Beautiful absolutely. word moderation yeah. when it comes down to mm -hmm. exercise, medicine, and everything I try to else. use the word moderately as well. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and tell your son as well, moderation, my son, <laughs> moderation. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but coming up next, we'll be talking about a common brain disorder that more than 38 million people suffer from, migraines. Yes, hey, it's, it's a headache all around. Stay tuned to hear about what causes them and how they're treated. You're watching the Health Channel, All Health All the Time. Visit the website, allhealthallthetime.com. Questions there for experts or find out more about the Health Channel on South Florida PBS. We'll talk those migraines and more when we come back. Every year, millions of Americans are exposed to a contagious virus. What is this virus? It's stigma. Stigma promotes an environment of shame, fear, and silence, which prevents millions of people from seeking help. But 
there's good news. The National Alliance on Mental Illness believes stigma towards mental illness is 100% curable. So do yourself and everyone a favor. Go to curestigma.org and get tested for stigma. In late 2010, I entered a BMX dirt jumping contest and took a hard slam. And I'd done the trick a thousand times, I suffered a traumatic brain injury. Now I'm not telling you not to send it, not to go out there and get it done. But what I am saying is learn about brain injury and how to prevent it. Our sport is cool enough. You can wear a helmet. CAR T-cell therapy is a revolutionary new treatment for cancer. Healthcare companies developing CAR T immunotherapy use Thermo Fisher's DynaBeads technology to isolate, activate, and expand T cells that have been genetically engineered to recognize and fight cancer cells. We're taking the patient's own cells and enriching those cells to fight the cancer. For more, go to thermofisher.com slash CTS. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Ed Berliner. Once again, thanks for joining us. With us today, Dr. Paul Damsky, neurologist at the Baptist Health Neuroscience Center. This hour, we have talked about how to improve your brain function by living a healthy lifestyle, exercise, video games, doing crossword puzzles. But we're going to touch now on a common neurological disorder that many people have and that can actually be sometimes treated through lifestyle changes. We're talking about something that is debilitating to so many people, migraine headaches. All right, doctor, break it down for us here. What is the difference between a regular headache and a migraine headache? I don't have a good definition for regular headache, but what, typically what people say is I get a regular headache, it's probably a dull pain. I, I'm guessing most people who talk about that would have what we call episodic tension type headache. So kind of a pressure-like feeling over most of the head, comes when they haven't eaten enough, comes when they haven't had enough sleep. They're stressed. I think it was really described initially as tension headache because people were tense and they would get their headaches. Uh, migraine is a very specific type of headache. It can be triggered by some of the same things that a tension headache can be. Um, but what happens is that you have to have a variety of things. Uh, we were talking a little about uh, someone in the studio who had visual changes before a headache. So a kaleidoscope is how that was described, and that's rather typical. You get this crazy spinning wheel effect, or you'll get spots in the vision, bright stars. You may actually lose vision to one side. You can see to the other side, but it really will affect the vision. So that's what we call an aura. Headaches with migraines can come without aura That as is well. a migraine, though. Uh, interesting, because usually the, the headache that was described to me here is a migraine with aura. So you get the aura first, typically last 10 to 60 minutes. That ends and within a short time you'll then get the bad headache. Um, it doesn't have to come with aura and you'll find as people get older sometimes they'll actually just get the aura and the headache goes away. So a few times a year they'll suddenly be blind in a similar weird kaleidoscopic psychedelic fashion but they don't get the headache and that will, it will be a, an aura without the migraine itself. Uh, but with the migraine, the headache portion is usually what we, people think of as the migraine, as the headache. That is going to be a severe headache, and they're just like you showed a list of dementia protocol. We have lots of ways of making definitions, and you've got to pick from the Chinese menu and a few things from here and a few things from there. But with a migraine, basically, it tends to be one side, can be both sides. It should be a severe headache. It should typically have some pulsatility or throbbing, a boom, boom, boom kind of feel to mm -hmm. it. It should be severe enough that you're not able to function at times. You just can't go into work. You can't deal with your kids. You can't do you know, sports or whatever. It will often get worse with exercise or with bending forward or climbing upstairs. Uh, and then there's some other features that are typical but not defining for it. So things like they're sensitive to light, they're sensitive to sound. If you have those, it lasts for at least four hours, less than three days, and you've had at least you know, five or six of them, then you've got migraines. Now, migraines are a tough problem. Uh, you know, it affects women in particular two or three times as much as it affects men. Why is that? Uh, presumably, there's a hormonal interest. Uh, and you find that sometimes when women get placed on birth control pills and it changes their estrogen and progesterone balance, they will often get fewer headaches. We find during pregnancy 
that and it, it's difficult to tell based on the woman, but the general trend is a third of women get better, a third of women get worse, and a third of women stay the same. So you've got two thirds of the women during pregnancy where the migraines change. So clearly the hormones play a role. Let's go ahead and use the 3D model that we have and let's look at what really happens inside the brain here with regard to migraine. So tell us what is causing the intense pain and then what we're seeing here. All right, I think the real answer is we're not quite sure. However. That's uh, medicine, we're, 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 always, we're always trying to learn. And I think one of the blessings yet difficulties with neurology in particular is we know so little about the brain compared to elsewhere because it's hard to get into that little black box and make changes and not do something bad to someone that you don't wanna then find out that you did something uh, difficult. Um, so what's the, happening here? Yeah, on, on the picture here, so uh, there is a nerve called the trigeminal nerve, uh, trigemini, so three twins essentially are triplets. It comes into three different branches here. Um, that particular nerve takes care of sensation in the face, but it also handles a lot of the sensation in the meninges or the coverings around the brain. So you've got the brain here, is that pink looking thing here. Outside of it on this picture is kind of this very faint looking covering, and those coverings are called the meninges. The meninges don't normally do a whole lot for us other than keep the brain in, and I'm sure there's a lot of metabolic stuff, but we don't really notice what they do. But sometimes we think that probably that trigeminal nerve somehow gets irritated where it's dealing with those meninges, and you then get this intense pain. And in addition to just electrically shooting nerve signals, we find a whole bunch of other interesting things. Uh, you find that if someone is in a functional MRI, where you're actually seeing where the blood is going, that there will be, a, particularly with those aura, the visual mm -hmm. chain is in the very back of the head called the occipital lobe. That's what produces a lot of the visual chains. And we'll find that if they're in one of those machines, all of a sudden the blood either goes up or goes down. There are probably blood vessels which seem to constrict or open up. You'll actually find platelets, which are the little particles of the blood that help take care of clotting, they'll actually be more active and you find people with migraines are more likely to get stroke, for instance. We've got about two minutes left here, so let me get to the risks sure. real quickly here. Do we really understand the risks and do we really understand how to avoid them? Risks of what brings about Of getting that? a migraine. Um, okay, so Those I, I triggers, think... triggers, if you Yeah, will. I think triggers is the best way to, to think about it. And we've been trying to focus today on a lot of the behavioral things that one can do and exercise and supplements and such. Uh, probably the most important thing for a migraine patient is to pay attention to your own migraines. And I will often recommend keeping a headache diary. So that would be on your phone, on a piece of paper, on a calendar. I got a headache today. It was 7 out of 10. I had 6 hours of sleep. I had red wine, you know, smelly cheese, whatever the case Keep may be. Keep track of everything. Keep track of everything for a while until you start to notice some pattern. There are clearly some triggers which are more common than others. I will occasionally get patients who get really upset with me for not realizing that I missed their one trigger. I bumped into a friend and she said, how come you didn't know that it was my dental cream? Well, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I can't know everything. Typical things, caffeine, too much or too little, you know, someone who's used to a lot and suddenly breaks off will have some problems. Different kinds of red wines, smelly cheeses, salamis and things like that, those will typically bring it about. Is there really then anything that we can do further than that? It just seems, migraines seem to be a mystery, no matter how people look at it. We, we can look at it, we can write them down, we can think about it, but it seems as if they happen regardless of what we do sometimes. Uh, they do, but there are things to do. Listen, as a neurologist, I, one of the things I can actually help my patients with is try to get them fewer headaches. I often can't get rid of them entirely but we can help to try to bring them down. And if you look at some of the drugs that are out there, some of the supplements, I mean, things, uh, low risk prob uh, thing would be something like a magnesium supplement. Problem is the data doesn't show that it works 100%. You got a, a few studies that say it helps, a few studies that say it doesn't help. But I think it's reasonable for something that's fairly low toxicity to go ahead and try that for a few weeks and see if it helps you out. We are still learning. 
yes. about about migraines absolutely, is, absolutely. is the one thing, and, yeah. and unfortunately, that that a lot of people are going to say cure me right away, but yeah, well, they medicine have to be doesn't realistic. work that yeah, way. Unfortunately, Doctor Damsky, thank you so much. You've Thanks answered a tremendous me. amount of questions. We have to do this again. We could do an entire hour, if if you will, sometimes on the on the migraines and, and the brain itself. That's all the time we have for today. Please be sure to join us next time on the Health Channel. All health, all the time. Please visit the website, allhealthallthetime.com. Submit questions for the experts or to learn more about the Health Channel here on South Florida PBS. We take the time to dig into these medical issues so that we can teach you how to live a little bit better, how to enjoy your life a little bit better, and also how to get the answers you need. I'm Edward Leonard. We'll see you next time.